Okay, so today is um, I'm record I'm recording my lecture about uh, again about chapter 22, but this time um, we're moving on from fauvism and expressionism to uh, cubism. So uh, those are the two early 20th century styles of abstraction or kind of proto-abstraction that we're learning about. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my PowerPoint. Okay, hope you can see this now. Okay, so um, last time I started the lecture with a uh, uh, with uh, this chart, which was uh, created by the curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York in the 1930s as a kind of genealogy of abstraction, you could say. <laughs> like he, wanted, he was trying to represent how um, modern art at the time, that being abstraction mainly, how, how it evolved from the late 19th century. So in Barr's way of thinking, the post-impressionists, Gauguin, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and Seurat, to some extent, gave rise to sort of two schools, you could say, of early abstraction. Fauvism, which we talked about last time, and Cubism, which we talk, we're going to talk about today. And then those sort of cross-pollinated but with all these other things, and this is where it gets really complex. We are going to talk about Dadaism and Surrealism next on Wednesday. We'll talk about Dada and next week about Surrealism. And these other things are important, but we don't really have time to talk about them. You can look into them if you want to. But the bottom line is that he thought there were kind of two categories of abstraction, non-geometrical abstraction, and geometrical. So geometrical abstraction would be abstraction that's based on, you know, squares, rectangles, circles, sort of the forms that you learn about in the shapes that and forms and masses that you learn about when you study geometry. And then non-geometrical abstract art, which is everything else, <laughs> like the shape of a hand or, you know, an amoeba would if you just drew a sort of amoeba shape, that would be non-geometric because it was not a circle, it's not a cone, it's not a square. So that that's that was sort of Matisse's style, as you recall. But today we're going to talk about Brock and Picasso. Okay, so Picasso. Um, a lot of times when people see Picasso's paintings. They think, oh my God, that that guy just couldn't draw. But that's not true. He was. There aren't very many fine art prodigies. I mean, there's a lot of music prodigies and math prodigies and chess prodigies. People who can draw really well at a really early age are pretty rare. But Picasso was one of those people. He was just obsessed with drawing. Went from a very early age, and lucky for him, his. Uh, father was an art teacher and so um, you know Picasso was able to study academic figure drawing from a very early age and basically that's all he would do when when they made him go to school he was just like no <laughs> give me a pencil and a piece of paper and I'm gonna go in the kitchen and draw and that's what they they just sort of said okay whatever so he ended up uh, you know, spending his childhood kind of learning to draw from, this is a drawing from a plaster cast, not a model, obviously. So art schools at that time had casts of, or sort of copies of classical sculpture that students could copy. And that was one of the things that you learned when you were in art school in the late 19th century. Okay, so the first painting that we're going to talk about by Picasso in this lecture is Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. So 
and and we're learning about cubism and how cubism evolved but this is not considered by art historians to be a cubist painting it's a proto cubist painting that means it, it's kind of a it sort of uh laid the groundwork for for cubism but it wasn't really cubist it wasn't abstract enough really to be cubist okay so let's just you know, when we talk about art, there's three things we sort of go into. The formal qualities of art, that is, you know, the lines, the shapes, the colors, the depth, space, and all of that stuff we study in Chapter 3. The composition, that's part of it. And then we study the content, that is, what is this about? <laughs> Sometimes if it's very abstract, it's hard to say what it's about. And third, the context, like, what, what was going on around this painting when it was made and where it was made. Okay, so first let's just talk about the content. What is, who are Les Demoiselles d'Avignon? So Demoiselle means young ladies of Avignon, which means it actually refers to the red light district in a city, Barcelona, I think, in um, maybe Spain. I think it's in Spain. Barcelona's in Spain. It might be in Portugal. I'm not certain about that. But anyway, Picasso was a Spaniard. He was from Spain. He was living in Paris when he made this painting. And he, he sometimes went back to Spain or wherever Barcelona is. And he, he would go to the whorehouses there. And so what this is about is about a visit to a whorehouse, basically. Kind of like, and that's not a new subject for European art at all. Think back to Monet's painting Olympia where you are confronted with a prostitute who looks up and sees you and her cat sees you. Um, and also Degas made paintings of prostitutes in brothels and drawings. So it wasn't a new idea to do this. But Picasso has done it in a way that takes the avant-garde quality of those earlier brothel paintings to the next level. It's scary. I mean, a lot of people look at this and sort of jump back. Ah! It's a really big painting to begin with, and Picasso didn't show it to too many people at first. He kept it in his studio behind a curtain so nobody could see it because he knew it was upsetting. So Picasso, again, he, he had a habit of going to brothels and he um, he he was at the same time attracted to prostitutes and terrified of them because at the time if you got a, a sexually transmitted disease you were kind of toast I mean there weren't that many um, there antibiotics had not come along yet and there sometimes there were certain sexually transmitted diseases that were incurable, like syphilis, and people really did die of syphilis. So, um, you know, people are afraid of AIDS now, but in the early 20th century, people were terrified of syphilis. Anyway, so he had this sort of terror of sexually transmitted diseases, but he was also fascinated by prostitutes, and he had, his whole life he had a kind of ambiguous relationship with women, a kind of love-hate relationship with women, which I guess is not that unusual <laughs> for guys. Anyway, um, but okay, so that that's sort of the content of it. It's a brothel. What's the, what's the, for, what are the formal qualities of it? Like how, how did he make it? Well, first of all, you can see that there's no deep space here. He didn't create a vanishing point. He didn't create linear perspective, right? Renaissance linear perspective. He didn't model the bodies of the women to make them look real. I mean, at least Manet kind of did that a little bit in Olympia. So there's no academic figure drawing here, even though, as we said, Picasso could do it perfectly if he wanted to. <laughs> and then there's all these weird kind of um, people have noticed how weird the heads are. That's sort of the first thing that students usually notice. Like this woman 
she's got her back to you, but she seems to be wearing a, a, like a mask over her head. And this woman also appears to have some kind of mask. And wh why is this person's head brown, but the rest of her is sort of pink? So there's, there's a lot of, and, and it's sort of hard to tell what's going on with the drapery here. Like, it, it's, it, it looks, this part looks like a sheet. This looks like a tablecloth. But there's a kind of a curtain here, too. So what's that about? Okay, well, apparently in 19th century and early 20th century brothels, the way it worked was the client would arrive at the whorehouse and be in a little waiting room, kind of. And then the prostitutes would come out from behind a curtain and kind of parade around in this waiting room. And that was where the client would pick which prostitute he wanted to have sex with. And then he'd pay the, the madam <laughs> and then, you know, go back to that prostitute's room to have sex with her. So th this is the parade part of that whole ritual. That is when they emerge from behind a curtain and kind of strut their stuff, you could say. And then there's a, a table here with a sort of still life on it with some grapes, a piece of melon, and we don't know what these things are, maybe some prosciutto, after all it's Spain, um, and an apple or something. Okay, so this is, you know, Picasso has created this very shallow space and this kind of awful urban light that does, looks like the fluorescent lights in a in a big box store or something. It's not an attractive kind of light. And it's not, above all, it's not mimetic. It doesn't imitate nature or reality. So where, where does this painting even come from? Okay, so in part, it comes from Cezanne. So Cezanne was one of the post-impressionists that we haven't really talked about yet in the 19th century. But he had a huge effect on early, the early 20th century painters, and specifically uh, Brock and Picasso, who invented Cubism. All right, so who was Cezanne? Well, Cezanne was a sort of a hermit. He, he lived in the south of France, in Aix-en-Provence, and he was kind of isolated, and he spent years in X sort of exploring new ideas about painting, kind of on his own. And what and he painted a lot of landscape and a lot of still life and some portraits. But what Cezanne ultimately kind of discovered, you could say, is that you never in real life, you don't really see things from one point of view. I mean, that's sort of the premise of linear perspective, right? There's one viewpoint. You're, it's not even two eyes. You, with linear perspective, you close one eye, you look through a little hole, and you see a scene, and then you draw on a sort of fictive pane of glass that's between you and the scene. And and you know you you can't move from that point the whole time you're drawing right and it's it if you're trying to draw like that it's actually really hard sometimes when i'm trying to do that and i have to stop and go to the bathroom or something i actually put masking tape on the floor to remind myself of where i was standing because if i come back to the still life setup that is still life just means like um, in Fran French, it's nature mort, <laughs> dead nature. It's just, you know, vessels and fabric and fruit and flowers sometimes. It's just stuff arranged on the table. It's not, it, it, in Cezanne's time, it was not considered a, a very prestigious genre of painting. But it's where how you learn to paint. At least it's how I learned to paint. <laughs> I set up some things, and then I'd figure out how to paint them, you know. But Cezanne figured out that why, when he came back from his bathroom break or his lunch or whatever, if he didn't stand in exactly the same spot, things would look different. Like, and he's just decided to go with that. Like, instead of trying to always stay in the same place, he's like, no, I'm just going to paint what I see wherever I am. 
So that, that creates the situation where this pitcher is slightly tilted to the left. The edge of this bowl kind of extends way, way out compared to this edge. This glass appears to be tilted toward you. Okay, here, here I've got a glass. All right, so now it's at your eye level, but if I put it down on the... Okay, I'll just do that. If I put it down... Let's just experiment with this glass a minute. Okay, here, here it is from one point of view. But if I raise the camera, you can see that it looks different now. It What looked like a ellipse, the edge of the jar here. It now looks like a circle. Okay, so that's, that's the big insight of cubism. <laughs> It's pretty pretty obvious if you think about it, but you know people had not tried to paint that before. Now it, you can also notice that the edge of the table here. It's, this is either bad carpentry or two tables jammed together, or it's just that Cezanne decided he was not going to worry about whether this was all consistent. And the same in the back. Now this has actually happened to me by accident. <laughs> where I accidentally painted the edge of a table or the background of the shelf or something on two different levels. And then I, by the time I noticed it, it was sort of too late and I just had to go with it, you know. But Cezanne is, he's not a beginner like me. <laughs> he knows he's doing this and he's doing it on purpose to make a point, which is that vision in real life is not like linear perspective. So Brock and Picasso, the painters that we're going to be talking about today, had seen the big retrospective, that means a big show with a lot of paintings by Cezanne in Paris around 1906, uh, in the early 20th century. And by this time Cezanne was dead, but Brock and Picasso both realized that but I think, I don't know exactly when Cezanne died, 1910 or so. They both realized that Cezanne was the 19th century painter that they had to sort of reckon with, that they had to sort of assimilate and then surpass, you could say, or take it to the next level. Because by, by this time, avant-garde painting, that's what it meant. You sort of see the previous painter's bid and you raise him, right? That's how you win. You have to take it to the next level. Take it to 11. <laughs> All right, so remember we talked about um, Matisse taking it to 11 here with the color. So Matisse had, you know, Matisse had also seen the large bathers, as we talked about last time. Um, and, and this was his answer to it, a sort of a, a fauvist or expressionist answer to the large Cezanne's large bathers, which sets the scene in a kind of mythical Ar Arcadian past where everything's beautiful and perfect, and it's called le bonheur de vivre, the joy of living, you know, and everybody's hanging around, playing music, having sex, kissing, dancing, um, picking flowers, just, you know, this perfect sort of um, beautiful paradise kind of scene. So this is Matisse's response to Cezanne. And then Picasso has seen Matisse's painting hanging in the living room of the American collectors, Gertrude and Leo Stein. And he's like, I got to take this to the next level. I have to take it to 11. So this is, so he does. <laughs> so this is Picasso's answer, kind of, to Matisse. It's like, I see your bonheur de vivre and I raise you. So what he does is, instead of setting it in a mythical Arcadian past, he puts his women in a contemporary Spanish whorehouse and says, you know, your your mythical past is BS. This This is what this is what reality is, sort of. I mean, in reality, women don't have a nose over to the side like that. But this is what 
contemporary painting should look like is basically what he's saying. All right, so, so what had so again, what, what, but he doesn't, he, he at least acknowledges Matisse in this painting. It's not like he, he's referencing Matisse, you could say. So how do we know that? Well, see this woman here with her elbows up in the air. <laughs> um, Picasso has referenced that woman in his own painting. So there's five women in his painting and they each kind of reference something different. Uh, this one is almost like saying, okay, Matisse, I saw your painting and this, and this is, this is my answer to it. But what about these women over here with, or these three women with these weird heads, what's going on there? Well, this is Picasso's version of so-called primitivism. So this was a thing in early 20th century art. And primitivism could mean a lot of things. It could mean trying to make your painting look like a child's painting, trying to make your painting look like a painting from Africa or uh, Asia or um, Oceania. <laughs> For Picasso, it meant you using some of the artifacts that he had found seen in the Trocadero Museum, specifically uh, some ancient Iberian art. Iberia is the Spanish peninsula. So we'll, I'll show you some slides in a minute of, of those. Well, let's just go to that now. Okay, this is um, Picasso at the age that he was approximately when he made Les Demoiselles d'Avignon and you, you can in his studio. So you can see that he's collecting so what was then called primitive art. Now we put primitive in quotation marks because it's not primitive. It's not any less sophisticated than European art, but that's the way Europeans thought of it. Now, France was the center of a huge empire, world empire that had collected art from its conquered colonies in Africa and uh, Oceania, which is the Pacific Islands that France controlled. And a lot of that loot had sort of been brought back to Paris and it was housed in a museum called the Trocadero. So Picasso went into the Trocadero one day and saw some of this, this African art and he, it just blew his mind. But he was also really interested in ancient European art from the Spanish Peninsula and that's this is what he, this head that he saw in the Louvre Museum, which was from uh, Spain, but it was like, you know, thousands of years old. And he just fell in love with it, and he arranged to have it stolen <laughs> from the Louvre. <laughs> now, he didn't steal it himself. He got his friend uh, Baudelaire, to, his, Baudelaire's secretary stole it, and got it somehow to Picasso's, studio where he kept it for a couple of years and then he returned it anonymously and he used it as a kind of model you could say for this portrait that he made of Gertrude Stein the collector who had bought Matisse's painting Le Bonheur de Vivre. Gertrude Stein was an American living in Paris and so you can see that these uh Almond, shape, almond shape, eyes. eyes. I know exactly, know exactly how, how, to how, to how, to how to describe their shape. Describe their shape. And he used, and he those, used those to, to in, in Gertrude Stein's, Gertrude Stein's face. face. But he also, he also used that, that influence on the head of this woman here, who also, she doesn't just look like that Iberian sculpture. She also looks a little Egyptian. You know, her, her hands are rigidly down at her side, and she, her hand is in a fist like the Egyptian sculptures and she's got her left foot forward like those sculptures of the pharaohs. So there's various ancient sort of models for this woman here. But what about the other ones? Okay, so all right, so here's some examples of the masks that the African masks that Picasso saw in the Trocadero that had a huge influence on him. So he, the thing that he admired about these masks, you could say, was their ability to abstract the f human face 
the features of the human face. They're not naturalistic, right? They don't really look like people. But you know that there are faces because there's two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. It's just that the features are abstracted. So Picasso took that idea that of abstracting and, and sort of primitivizing the faces of these women and put these so-called primitive heads on them. So let's go back to his, one of his drawings. Okay, so Picasso made hundreds of drawings in preparation for Les Demoiselles. In the beginning, he actually included two male figures, a, a, a sailor. How do we know this is a sailor? Well, the, the n uniform of the French Navy involved red pants and a blue jacket, apparently. So that's how we know it's a sailor. And this guy is a medical student. And we know that because he's, in some of, he's carrying a skull, apparently. And in some of the drawings, he's holding a little bag. But Picasso, and, and the five women are still present, right? Picasso eventually eliminated the two men so that when you see the painting in its finished form, they the, the prostitutes are confronting you, the viewer, just like they did in Manet's painting, right? So you are the client, not a sailor or or a doctor, medical student. And then he also changed, okay, in, this, in the sketch, there's some flowers and some fruit, and he kind of changed all that in the painting to be this kind of arrow pointing at this woman here. Now, why is, why is that the case? Because, according to various art historians, she is the one that the customer has chosen to have sex with. And we know that partly because this kind of phallic still life is pointing at her, but also because you see her from two points of view, allegedly. You see her kind of standing up, but you also see her as if she's lying down because no one could stand up with their legs sort of crossed like that, right? It, you would fall over. So you're seeing her from at two different points in time. When you first come in the, the waiting area, you see her standing up. And then later, when you go back with her to her room, you see her lying down, like with a sheet sort of pulled over. So, so that's, that's Cezanne's idea, right? You don't see something... You see things from different point of view, from different points of view at different times, even if it's just a jar, right? It looks like this now, but if I look down on it, it looks different. So Picasso's just taking that idea that Cezanne had about still life and transferring it to the human figure, really. There's a lot more that we could say about this painting, and I hope that you'll... Um, we can discuss it in the in the discussion on Friday. I'm sure you can come up with some interesting questions about it. Okay, so let's talk about Cezanne again for a minute. Let's go back to this. So Cezanne, again, is sort of the forerunner, you could say, of Cubism. His landscapes, especially, um, were influential for Picasso and his friend Brock. So um, Cezanne painted Mont Saint Victoire, this mountain in in the in Provence where he lived. He painted it repeatedly, and towards the end of his life, in the early twentieth century, he began painting it almost abstractly. So you know the the clouds behind Mont Saint Victoire and the mountain itself are painted in the same way, and it's almost hard to tell what's a cloud and what's the mountain. And similarly down here, it's hard to tell the houses from the trees or the houses from the wheat fields or whatever they are down here. It's just all little brush strokes of color that merge into each other. And it's almost, it's you can't see sort of separate houses and trees. It's all 
part of the same surface, you could say. So, but earlier, Cezanne sort this is the ultimate result of Cezanne's explorations, but 15, 20 years earlier, he was painting kind of more recognizable um, landscapes, but kind of leaving them unfinished, like there would be a big parts of the canvas still exposed and so on. But he was working towards this idea of sort of the background and the foreground not being as distinct as they would be in a sort of conventional landscape painting. So Brock had seen all this and he decided in the summer of 1908 to go to the south of France and where Cezanne had lived and just paint the same landscapes that Cezanne had painted and see if he could take Cezanne to the next level. So so what he so this is an example of that. This is one of the first paintings that people began to call cubist. And you can see why. These there's these cubes, okay? <laughs> the houses look like little cubes. And that's important, but cubism is a misleading name. It's not just about reducing everything to cubes. What it's really about, one of the things it's really about, is sort of that same idea that Cezanne came up with, that you don't see things really from one point linear perspective. Really you're moving around in a landscape and you see the same thing from different points of view. and it's not actually true when you walk through a town that your experience is that this tree is always in front of this house and this tree is always in front of this house. And, and Brock is messing around with that. Like if you look at this, it's hard to tell what's in front and what's in back. I mean, when in our first, in the chapter three, I think the book talks about the way you create, uh, the textbook talks about the way you create deep space on two dimensions, a flat piece of paper or canvas, is that you put things, smaller things, you put smaller things in the background and that makes them look like they're in the background and you overlap things, right? That's sort of painting 101. Brock is messing with that. Like if you, even if you just, just this one tree is really confusing, okay? It's not clear if this is a house that the tree is in front of or if this is part of a rock that the tree is coming out of. And then when you look into the branches here, the green leaves, some of them don't seem to be in front of these houses back here. They're sort of behind the tree, maybe. Like, is this green pat shape here, is that part of this tree? Or is it part of a different tree back there? And this one is super confusing. This branch, okay. It comes out here and you think, okay, this is from a tree that's in front of these houses. Oh, wait. What's going on here? This seems to be merging with another tree back behind this roof. What? And pretty soon you're all you're kind of confused and your desire to make this into a renaissance painting where the things in front are closest to you and the things in back are furthest away from you that's kind of frustrated right you can't you can't see it that way it won't let you see it that way and you're forced to see it more like you would if this was a sort of composite of views that you saw as you walked through this town. So in a way, it's more truthful than the Renaissance painting would have been, according to Brock and Cezanne. All right, so let's look at some more instances of that. Okay, so this this is Brock's painting in the viaduct, um, which is, we talked about viaducts, I think, when we talked about the Romans. They built these... Um, things to bring water down from the mountains that are still there in South France. So, and Cezanne painted the same viaduct over and over. All right, so again, we have this kind of funny merging of trees in the foreground with trees in the background and roof lines that are unclear as to whether they're, 
is I mean, is this tree in front of this house or is this house in front of this tree? We can't tell because of this sort of confusing border between those two shapes there there that's called passage that is when Cezanne did it it was called passage so we'll just call it passage here and and here it's even more noticeable this tree which appears to be in front of this roof merges w with a tree behind the roof and then the roof kind of slips down here as it might look if you saw it from a different point of view this is p also passage and then right here, where the front of this house, you know, the side of the house appears to merge with the roof right there. So it's just these little details that sort of mess with your perception, right? And force you to see this as not, not a, a one, you're not standing in one place looking at the scene from one point of view. You ha you must be looking at it from different points of view. Okay, so eventually, Pica and Picasso was aware of all these experiments that Brock was doing with, and, and pretty soon he and Brock were working together on this new style of, of cubism. But I, th I don't know, but I, I kind of think Picasso may have been the first one to apply it to the human figure. Because he'd already kind of done that with Le Demoiselle, right? Which Brock had seen. So Brock, it's almost like Brock said, okay, Le Demoiselle d'Avignon plus Cezanne equals um, cubism. He took Picasso's idea, he took Cezanne's idea and sort of fused them to make cubism. But then Picasso saw what Brock was doing and he's like, okay, well, why couldn't we apply that to the human figure as well? So this is one of Picasso's paintings from their the days of their early experiments with cubism. You know, girl with a mandolin. Okay, it's pretty easy in this painting. It's it's disturbing because it, the human form is fractured. You could say, but you can pretty clearly see the mandolin, her arm, her breasts her head, her eyes seems to be closed, her hair, and, you know, maybe this is some sort of wall behind her or something. But, you know, it is seen from different points of view. It's not the neck of the mandolin is seen from shifting points of view. So, but this was just the beginning. <laughs> but... Later that year, Picasso had made a painting that almost completely dissolves the the human form into geometric abstraction. So, again, it's called The Guitarist, and for various reasons, Brock and Picasso were both really interested in people playing musical instruments. That's a common theme. I think because it was pretty common thing to see in Paris in a bar or on the street you'd see people busking you know um, and also they were both interested in music because music was an interesting analogy to abstract painting in that a tune even if it has a title like I'm learning a, a tune now called uh, Drowsy Maggie okay so that has a title it's a girl's name but there's nothing in the tune that, there's no words to the tune, so it doesn't tell you really, it's just an abstract, a tune is abstract. It goes da 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 Well, that's not a very good <laughs> representation of the tune. But it doesn't have words that sing about, you know, how she got dra drowsy or anything like that. You just have to kind of imagine that. So pure music with no words is abstract, you know. So uh, that may have been part of the reason they were obsessed with music. Anyway, you can you can see kind of you can see the fretboard, right? Or the the neck of the guitar. You, maybe this is the head, these are the shoulders, maybe this is the elbow, is this a shoe? I mean, you you can sort of here's the this could be the this round shape could be the the hole in the guitar. I mean, it looks like there might be a bench here. 
or a chair. This could be the edge of the guitar. So this is pretty abstract. It's pretty hard to see a guitarist in this in the same way that we would have. So this is going back to the Renaissance, a Caravaggio painting of the same subject, a, a, a boy or, or maybe a woman playing a, a lute. So, you know, this is what Picasso and Brock were sort of trying to get rid of. They were tired of this. They could do it, but they were just like, eh, we've been doing this for 400 years. Why would we keep doing this? Let's do something different. Okay, so now 1911, Brock um, makes a painting called The Por Portuguese, which is also about a person playing a musical instrument. Um, I think this one's a little easier to see what's going on. There, Here's the whole of the guitar. These could be the strings or the frets. You can sort of see a face here, an eye, a nose, maybe a mustache. A lot of times these um, analytical cubism paintings have text um, or stenciled symbols like this ampersand. So, you know, there, there are very recognizable things like the text and um, there's a rope here and so on, but it doesn't, you, you kind of have to put it together in your mind. Another thing you probably noticed about this analytical cubism style of painting is the suppression of color. There's It focuses mainly on lines and shape. So this is a detail of that painting and you can see the the sound hole maybe the strings or the frets, and then the the neck of the guitar in perspective going away from you, and maybe these are fingers on the guitar. All right, so their experiments with analytical cubism soon gave way to a new phase of cubism called synthetic cubism. So an analytical cub cubism was about taking things apart. That's what you do when you analyze something. Synthetic cubism is called that because it was sort of assembled, putting things together. In this case, um, using collage. So Brock and Picasso started using bits of paper that they found, like newspapers or fake wood grain paper that you could buy like at a hardware store or something. And they started using these um, found papers and objects in in their paintings. So here, this is still a still life. It's still fruit dish and glass. All right, so here's the fruit, a pretty naturalistic drawing in charcoal of some grapes. Um, maybe, I don't know, here's the edge of the dish or the glass. I don't know. I mean, the glass has been pretty much fractured. It's hard to see. Maybe this is the bottom rim of a wine glass. And then again, there's text. Bar, <laughs> we know what that means. Ale, <laughs> we know what that means. So even in French, <laughs> we can tell what those words mean. The wood grain paper here stands for the paneling in the bar where these, this table is. And then this is the table, presumably. It stands for the wood of the table. A lot of these are sort of what you would find on a table in a cafe in Paris where the, where these guys spend a lot of time. All right, so Picasso sees that <coughs> and he says, I'll, I'll do that too. I'll raise you even. So he buys some cheesy wallpaper <laughs> and glues it onto cardboard or piece of paper or something. And then again, get some of that wood grain paper like Brock was using to signify a guitar. All he needs now to signify a guitar really is some wood grain paper cut in the shape of a guitar and then another piece of paper cut in the way you would see the neck of the guitar if you were looking at it in perspective. He just glues a white thing here to to be the sound hole <laughs> and he makes a drawing, a, a cubist drawing with charcoal of the glass, glues that on there and then some sheet music. And this could be the bottom of the guitar or the, the edge of the table or both. And then, this is interesting, 
the paper, the, a newspaper in France is called Le Journal, but he just cut that off, the R and the N-A-L. And so now it reads Le Jeu, which means the game. La bataille s'est engagée. The, the battle has been joined. So there was a war going on in the Crimean Peninsula, I think, at this time. In the Balkans somewhere, there was a war going on, sort of in the run-up to World War I, which people didn't know it was the run-up to World War I. But, but other, other critics have said, La bataille s'est engagée. That means his, his rivalry with Brock. It's like, we're playing a game. You know, you, you made this, then I made this. Let's see what you can do next. Okay, so more of the same. This time he actually cut, instead of drawing fruit, he just said, hey, I'm just going to cut fruit out of a seed catalog. Why not? So he, he's really, I mean, he does make some drawings here, but he's really kind of giving the finger to the whole academic training thing, which he had totally mastered. He's like, no, not going to do that. Why should I draw, go to the trouble of drawing a pair when I can just cut one out? <laughs> Take that, art teachers. Okay, so eventually um, it got to the point that Picasso was making sculpture in this way which is really to us it may not seem that revolutionary but it was really a giant step for humankind when when Picasso figured out that these fractured drawings that he was making of guitars and uh, cups and newspapers he could just cut those out like he could draw the different parts of a guitar, cut them out of out of cardboard and or paper, and kind of assemble them into a, a, a sculpture. This was the first time anybody had ever made a sculpture like this. I mean, Picasso invented a lot of things, but this really was a quantum leap. Okay, so before Picasso made these kind of sculptures, sculpture was made by modeling in clay, you know, additive sculpture, like taking some clay, slapping it on there, smoothing it around, or subtractive, taking a chisel, cutting away the marble, and all of that. And Picasso had made sculptures that way. But th but this, there were two things that were crazy about this, really, from the point of view of that time period. One is that you could take found objects like he just used a can he eventually made a, a sheet metal version of the cardboard guitar and the sheet metal version used a can for the hole now think about that for a minute a hole in a guitar is a void right it's 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 an absence of something but picasso has made the hole into something that comes forward like a tin can and then he's just tied some strings to the can. He doesn't even make them come all the way down here to where the nut, not the nut, the bridge. He just ties them to the top of the hole. And then he has sort of part of the guitar here and another part here. So you're seeing it kind of from different points of view. There's a video on the Khan Academy site that's linked to in your content that explores this in more detail and you should you should look at it and it zooms in and rotates the whole thing so I think you'll understand this better when you, if you look at that video but the other thing that's amazing about this is that until Picasso people hadn't really made sculptures of human made objects like we make guitars right humans make guitars so why would you make a sculpture of something that's human made like sculpture was normally of the human form or animal forms or something like that but you know it would be like why would you make a sculpture of a smartphone like would you would you go to your class your clay pottery class and make you know a pottery version or ceramic version of a phone and then paint it to look like a phone i don't think so <laughs> I mean, that most people would think, like, why? But for Picasso, it made sense. And because it's not just exactly like a, a guitar, 
It doesn't look exactly like a guitar. It's a cubist guitar. It's a guitar seen from different points of view. So what? how did he come up with this? All right, well, again, it was his encounter with um, art from other parts of the world. In this case, an African mask that he owned, apparently, where the eyes of the fig human face here protrude. They're like cylinders that stick out of the mask. And, you know, apparently no European could have thought of that on his own. <laughs> that you could, your eyes are recessed in your face, right? They don't stick out like binoculars. It took the imagine in the imagination of the African person who created this mask, though, it could happen. So Picasso saw that and he was like, hmm, okay, so we can take a void or an absence of something, like the hole on a guitar, and make it not an absence, but a presence, something that sticks forward. All right, so I'll just take this can and glue it onto the sheet metal or weld it onto the sheet metal, and that will stand for the hole in the guitar. And actually, I'm going to indicate that the guitar is hollow by cutting away some of the this side of it and leaving that open so I'm, I'm going to give you all sorts of information about this guitar without actually making it look like a guitar hmm. <laughs> so basically what Picasso and Brock were doing was disrupting systems of representation and and you can see that pretty well in this this example of synthetic cubism. So he took some newspaper and he cut out a shape that was supposed to look like a siphon bottle. So a siphon bottle is a bottle where you pump, that they had in bars, where you pump it and a liquid comes out of a little spout. It's not literally a siphon. It's more like a spray, early spray bottle. So he cut the shape out of newspaper, but over here he glued newspaper down in various shapes and then drew on them with charcoal. He used some wood grain to create the shape of a violin here. I don't know what this is supposed to be. <laughs> the newspaper, maybe. But it, but it's not, ironically, it doesn't have any text on it. It does here, but not here. And then he, in big letters, he writes, journal. In other words, newspaper, in case you missed it. <laughs> so he's using words. To represent things in a painting which is sort of a novelty because normally like in Renaissance painting yeah there might be some text but you can't read it right um, there's Caravaggio didn't put the word guitar up here because that would sort of break the rules of painting which is that you don't use words but Picasso and Brock are like, no, we're going to use words like bar, ale, le journal, la bataille, <laughs> journal. So he loves that word journal and he puts it in a lot of these synthetic cubist objects. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about with cubism and we could continue. I could make this a much longer lecture and we could probably create a whole course about Picasso and Cubism, but I'm going to leave it at that. And hopefully you can come up with some questions, good questions about Cubism and maybe for the discussion on Friday. So one thing, when you're writing your question, sometimes I say write a question about chapter 22 and, and chapter 23, but make your question about that week's lectures like this week the lec today the lecture is about cubism and on wednesday it's going to be about data so your question should be either about cubism or data those two lectures so um and something that was discussed in the lecture i mean there's a lot of stuff in the book that we don't talk about in the lecture and vice versa so make it about things that everybody has seen in the lecture Okay, so hopefully I'll see you on Friday.